Okay, so what are you drinking in that cool Yeti cup of yours? It is cool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I really love this cup. But, you know, in one way, I wish I would have got an orange one like you have. Why? I like your white one. It looks so good. But what are you drinking? Mineral water from where they think they found Noah's Ark, I believe, near Turkey and Armenia. Oh, wow. That's Mount Ararat. Well, I know one thing for sure. It really, really helps clear my voice. And I love the taste of this stuff. Well, I want a sip. Here. Here you go. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone, and here we are celebrating what people love to do creatively by giving them a voice. I'm Rod Jones. And I'm Angie Jones. Welcome to the Thought Rope Podcast. We invite you to subscribe wherever you listen, and we're available virtually anywhere you listen to podcasts. And also, check us out on thoughtropepodcast.com. There you can listen to our episodes and find out a little bit more about what each guest, their background is, and some photos of them. And also, you can drop us a line. Yes, and we would love to hear from you. And don't be shy. You know, it's pretty easy to do. You just go to the Contact Us page yeah. and give us your thoughts. We love to hear what you have to say, your thoughts and ideas on the Thought Row podcast. Plus, we answer everybody. I mean, we're pretty good at that. So uh, don't be afraid to reach out to us. Yeah, absolutely. We won't e ignore your email like when you send emails to some um, places. Sometimes you don't get a reply back, but no, we actually reply back and um, it's super easy on the contact form. All you have to do is put your email, type in your message and hit send. It's really simple. Yeah. In fact, I think we responded to some people today. Yeah, we did. Okay. How about my favorite part, your weekly quote? Okay. This is a really great quote and it's be brave, take risks, Nothing can substitute experience. And that's by Paolo Coelho. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about him because yeah, once do. I got the quote, I wanted to find out more about him because I wasn't really like it didn't gel at who it was. Tell us. Okay. He is a lyricist and a novelist who has become one of the most widely read authors in the world. And he's one of the most famous Latin Americans today. And his most celebrated novel is an international bestseller, The Alchemist, which has been translated into 80 languages and sold more than 65 million copies. It tells the story of a young shepherd on a spiritual journey to the Egyptian pyramids in search of treasure. You know what? He would be a perfect guest. He would. Uh, he would be, be so guest. great. And I'm sure he would have much to say. And uh, our listeners would certainly learn by him as one of the most famous novelists. Yeah, that's that's quite a quite a lot of copies out there in the world. Yeah. And I, and I suspect his journey, his creative journey must have been incredible. And I'm sure there was great days and I'm sure there were difficult days, but he's really accomplished a lot. And I don't think there's too many authors out there that can that have the same. Well, that's quite. Yeah, that's quite a pedigree to have, really. Yeah. On, on your, on your writing. And, yes. I, and I have you read the book? I have not read the book, but now it's on my list to read because I don't know how it's escaped my radar, but it has. Well, I've certainly heard of the book mm -hmm. and I did a little research on him, like you said, for this podcast. But now I want to read that book. Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe we should start a book club. We can all read it and have a discussion on some social media somewhere. That yeah, could be fun. That could be kind of fun. Well, something to think about. So tell us on the contact page. Do you, Would you like to do that? And let us know. Yeah, we just need more work. <laughs> yeah, we just need more work to do. Right on. Yeah, really. <laughs> okay, so now it's your turn, Rod. We're ready for Rod's motivational moments. Well, you know what? I'm going to pick up a little bit from your quote. And mine is, it's best to pursue your dreams by following what your heart desires or what your heart desires most. Isn't that the truth, though? If you don't follow your heart desires... You're usually not really happy. You feel frustrated. 
and you you want to always get to that point where you can do something you really enjoy. Well, as you know, we've discussed this before, yeah. and that's that listen to that little still voice within you. And sometimes it's hard to tune into that voice, but it's well worth it because you discover so many interesting things about what you really feel about, what you care about, what's mm-hmm. important to you. And those could be uh, good guides as to what you may want to achieve in life. You know, maybe you want to go to Egypt and find your own treasure. No, that could be it. That could be it. But I know we live in a world filled with opportunities. So it's just a matter of identifying the ones that suit you the best. Yes. And, you know, I think that every creative person, a lot of times they don't like this word necessarily, or they don't want to think of themselves as being entrepreneurs, but every creative person is an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And as an entrepreneur, you're responsible for your own game. You're responsible for creating the business of selling your creativity, whether it be art or if you're a singer, a pianist, whatever that case may be, it's really important to identify yourself a little bit as an entrepreneur. You're a business person and there's been books written about creative people not really embracing or understanding that side of the business, but be an entrepreneur, be excited. Well, also though, I think a lot of times creative people, that's the, that's the word that they don't want to hear because they would rather be doing their craft, painting, singing, dancing, whatever it may be, writing. And to sit there and have to market yourself is another whole enchilada. Well, and I true. think that they, they just they just go, oh gosh, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do the things I like to do. And unfortunately, it comes with the territory. You have to do some marketing. Otherwise, people don't know about you. Yeah, if they don't know about you, they certainly can't. And you can't sell your work. Uh, well, you can't sell and do it, it but they can't see it. They don't can't appreciate right. it. And there's some pretty incredible people out there that are pursuing their creative life and j- turning out some wonderful art mm-hmm. that people just aren't even seeing it because the people aren't out there marketing it for lack of a better term. True, and you're not selling out when you do that. By the way, nope, I don't That's, think you are. That is not a sellout. So. Yeah, and in this day and age, you can access information on any topic and use it to channel your thoughts on how you want to succeed in life, like understanding the aspect of marketing and letting people know about your uh, creativity. True. And then, uh, you know, as far as accessing info, I love YouTube. You can get so much information on there on a variety of things. Sometimes you have to look a little harder because some people's videos are not very comprehensive. But for the most part, you can find out a lot of information on there and also just on the Internet itself. I think what people are afraid to do, and I've become really good at this, is doing long tail search terms. You are so good at that, honestly. Instead of just, uh, you know, tell me about the color black, I'll write like two or three sentences. Sometimes I'll write a whole paragraph asking a question. Right. And Google loves that. They The algorithms seek out every bit of information that you provide it. The more information you give, the more information you're going to get in return. That's so true. And it's going to be closer to what you're actually asking. Yeah, you won't have to go through pages before you get to your answer. Yeah, so like how do I make market, it in detail? How do I market my art? But better yet, how do I market my creative landscape abstract art right. Be specific. that I do in California? There, there you go. That's really specific. That's a long tail, but they work. Yeah. Well, see, like I'm, I'm learning from you, even though I see what you do all the time. But I guess we learn from each other and... Like our podcast, you know, Thought Row podcast is about that by listening to others and, you know, how maybe it applies in our lives and how it might shape your life or what you can get out from inspiration and, you know, and having our own takeaways. Well, judging from the feedback we get from our listeners, one thing that always comes across as they go, I I just learned so much about being creative by listening to what this other person had to say, or they say, yeah. God, I could really relate with that person, even though they're entirely on the other side of the world. And maybe doing something entirely different. Doing, yeah, yeah, entirely different, but yet just understanding their creative journey and the things that their trials and tribulations in life. And, you know, we all learn from that. We can learn from other people's experiences and maybe, just maybe, hopefully, 
not have to live some of them. Yeah, and I think people, when they express themselves sometimes uh, and they're telling their life experience, it's not because they're just so into themselves. It's really because they want to impart wisdom and not have you go through that, you know, crappy experience. And you know, I think it's they're trying to be helpful when they do that. Yeah, they're very genuine. Yeah, I mean, very genuine. we're very thankful to our guests. I mean, they're extremely genuine and very open about what they have to say. Yeah, and I think the one thing that we all have to be careful of, of course, is we can't model ourselves 100% off of someone else's life. And we need to stay true to ourselves, you know, adapt the information that's given, but, you know, make it work for you. Yeah, being true to yourself. I mean, we look at other people's successes and, you know, we all get a little maybe envious or saying, I wish I could do that, whatever. You should celebrate other people's successes because you will want them to celebrate yours when you have them. Be happy for others, but also celebrate your own successes. Even the teeny ones turn out to be major ones as you move forward in your career. And sometimes the teeny ones are just like the preheating to what is great to become. So yeah, yeah, yeah don't, don't push that point. aside as, oh, it's just a little of whatever, but you never know where it's going to lead. So oh, wow, Angie, that go was a good, that's a good point. Yeah. But let's move on. Who's going to be our guest today? Okay. Well, today we're going to be speaking with Natalie Herrera Pacheco. Herrera. You yeah, rolled I'm, your R's I'm almost. I'm trying. I don't, you know, I lost the ability to roll my R's and I'm hoping it'll come back. I know. For some reason, it seems to have stuck with me. <laughs> you know, from our initial conversations with Natalie, I'm so glad we're having her as a guest. And I might add, it's very interesting to listen to her. You know, yes. I was particularly impressed by her philosophy and her creativity and especially her life's journey. And this is, she's a great guest and I'm so excited that we're having her on today. Yeah, I think you guys are really going to enjoy this. So let's bring her on now. Yes. Natalie, welcome to the Thought Row podcast. You know, we're always excited to have a guest that has lived their life so incredibly creatively like you have. Yes. Hi, Natalie. And yes, it's going to be an interesting interview for us and our listeners to hear your story. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm so happy to be here with you in this wonderful space. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, before we get started with the interview officially, we always like to ask our guests what they had for breakfast. So what did you have for breakfast? Well, I always have for breakfast exactly the same every single day, uh-huh. which is oatmeal with some nuts, agave syrup, almond milk, blueberries and coffee, probably too much coffee. <laughs> but no. that's every day. Yeah. Well, that's pretty healthy. That's pretty healthy. All the way yeah, around. Yeah, that's, that's my way to give some kind of sense to my day. Yeah, well, you know what? It gives you energy. You have blueberries for your vision. Yeah, your vision. So, um, very good. Yeah. Well, you know, after I want to talk a little bit about your website, after Angie and I had the opportunity to review your website, which I it's pretty spectacular. I mean, you have a, a, it's really beautiful. a lot of information on there, your background, your history, and of course, a lot of your photographs. You, you've really accomplished quite a bit in your life. But I think we would like to know, what was your childhood, childhood like? And when did you first start kind of thinking about photography? Well, I did have a very nice childhood, I have to say. And uh, if I want to start, Start from the beginning, I'll say that I am the youngest of four. Mm-hmm. And the difference between my brothers and I, my well, my sister, my two brothers and I, is like nine years. So fun story is that my mom went to the doctor to, uh, to have uh, her tubes tied. Mm-hmm. And she couldn't because she was pregnant and that was me. I was a mistake. <laughs> but you're a good so, mistake, see? I think so. <laughs> So because of by, by the time ultrasound was not like a big thing, yeah. they told her that I was a boy. Oh. And surprise again, I was a girl. 
<laughs> and they didn't have a name for me. So I was the girl without a name from a long time until they got a name. But I, it was like months without a name. Wow. So that, that I think was like a, a fun story how that started. And neither my parents did arts as profession, but they were and still are very, very creative. And oh, I remember good. all the time looking at them fixing stuff and my mom creating dolls. The, she also did underwear, clothes to sell in order to have some extra money. Right. So I, I was always behind her chair drawing <laughs> and she was up like creating stuff. And I feel like a, a, a great, I, I admire them, but mostly like my mom doing thing from scratch that's yeah. something that was so nice to have in my daily life that's so nice sure that she would she's uh, obviously very creative yeah and you as a, a young girl you got to watch all this you got go to watch on, all yeah. that and learn and see what she was doing tell us more yeah yeah and i think it was a real privilege to have her every day and i know that was also for her a big sacrifice but she was always there with her eyes on me and in, in my siblings. So I really know that that was a big opportunity. And about photography, I started thinking about photography very early in my life because I noticed that my siblings, they have a lot more pictures that I have at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was because of the, the history also of economical crisis. Like having pictures was very expensive, like printing them, buying film. And my dad didn't have like a, the money to spend in, in that thing. So I got the sense of photography and history very early. I wanted the pictures and I wanted my dad to take picture of me. Yeah. And I, I really wanted to touch that wonderful, magical object that was the camera. So I started thinking about photos and history, like right from I was growing up. See, that's really amazing because it's just the little thing of having your siblings have photos and you didn't have as many it kind of inspired you to get into photography or to and, achieve and to achieve and to be creative. So that's really interesting where inspiration comes from. Sometimes. I also, I also Natalie think it's very interesting how you came into this world. You were really <laughs> obvious. It was obvious that you were meant to be here. And I think they did a good job picking a name for you. Yeah. It's a beautiful <laughs> name. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> no, it's a beautiful name. Yeah. So we know that your family is very important to you from the stories you're just telling us, but you no longer live in Venezuela. It seems like it has created a hardship for you and your family because you can't be together. But tell us about that. How do, how do you handle that? Well, I think that being away from family mm -hmm. is something that is natural. It happened to a lot of people. You mm -hmm. get adulting is probably in part, like getting your space in most of the cases. But I think what is hard about it is not being away, but the impossibility of going back. Mm -hmm. And in this COVID situation, it was very interesting for me because I got to connect with people in other places and build some kind of empathy, what it means to see your beloved people through a screen. Yeah, and that you you know that you cannot touch them, that you cannot travel and see them in person, or hug so them. So I think right, or hug them, or even oh. hug them. Yeah, yeah, and see their eyes. So you learn that this is a, a a good moment because you have technology and you find ways to be present. But it's hard for for me and also for them to see our process of becoming older and not being there. So you get really attached to the technology part. So you get, you have to be creative. You have to like call, see the patio, see the birds. You have to ask them how is, are things going and use this, these little uh, artifacts and get involved in the narrative 
through their metallic voices. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not easy, but it's also an opportunity that we have right now. Well, I guess you could be thankful that we do have that technology now because not too many years ago, the best you could hope for was a phone call. Yeah. 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 In yeah, that, in the most of the cases, yeah. Yeah, and that was very expensive too, way back yeah. in the day. So, yeah, thank thank God now it's a little bit more open and, and cost effective. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a huge change and it makes a difference. Oh, yeah, definitely it does. So we know you live here in the United States. So how did you end up living in the United States and where did you, what did you and where did you study? Well, we came here because of my husband and uh, we came at the beginning to Michigan where he did his master's and then we started looking for other opportunities. He got to go to his doctoral program. So that's why we ended here and we started like just staying and that was the reason we ended here. And I didn't study here, but I did my PhD while living here and mm -hmm. I did it in Spain so it was my way to to keep my head running and kind of keep this like adventure of being in different places at the same time sure right well it it, it looks to me like you know both of your both you and your husband are very well educated mm -hmm. and I know that we learned from your website and earlier conversations that we've had with you that you hold several degrees and you've been educated in uh, other universities outside of the United States. Would you share with us that, what, what was that experience like, Natalie, coming from Venezuela and then completely to a new environment? Yeah, so different. Yeah, I, I think the most traumatic thing about it is the construction of otherness like understanding that you are the other and you start building an identity about it. For example, I didn't know that I was from a country called Venezuela because you, when you are in your country, you never use Venezuela. No. I was from my street and <laughs> I was from my, probably from my city and from my state, but never from a country. And I started telling Venezuela when I got here. Mm -hmm. So that construction of the, the, the a national identity was probably the the biggest effort, and I'm still working on it. Like I am the other, and I am from that abstract territory that is Venezuela. And also, it gave me a, a, the possibility. This situation of living in in, in another country is like a path, a deal that you have. So you have, yeah, the opportunity to create that identity, but you also learn like letting it go because you are embracing other, other cultures. I like the way that Patti Smith, the poet and writer, she once speaking about New York, she said, New York formed me and New York deformed me. And I think that's the experience of being away and uh, with the situation of going to universities, yes, you learn, you get more content, you get education, but the living experience, that construction is what form you and deform you, I, I guess. I think that, I think you stated that quite beautifully. You really did. That's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. And that is so true. A lot of times people in the country that they live in, and we've interviewed people from multiple countries, that they don't necessarily have ever had the opportunity maybe to go study outside of their country. So they're totally focused on what goes on their daily lives in their country. But you had it, I guess, for lack of a better term, you had to immerse yourself in another culture. And if I remember right, you had to learn how to speak English. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That was part of the process. I didn't know even a single word in English, like different than hi or hello. So it was a, a a long process of creating a sentence to thinking about who am I, like everything, like creating everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to think 
Angie can relate to that because yeah. she speaks Turkish. And then if she's thinking in Turkish, it's not like thinking in English. That's and she has different. to transfer it. Well, which I'm sure that you, when you think in your language, it's much different than, you know, when you express yourself through English because sometimes the words are not there. Yeah, it's sometimes I feel like it's like a character. I, I am not still in the place where I feel natural. I think that I, I have to put like another skin in order to try to express myself in the way that I think I am in Spanish. But it's quite different and it's interesting also. It's like being um, an actor, I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a really good analogy. That is. Because also, it, it takes out maybe the pressure also of feeling like, oh, I can't do this because I don't know the words. Uh, you, you can just act like you know, and, and it'll happen you for live, you. I like that. Yeah, you live the life. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, but I have to say that in this country, you are very, very patient about length, about waiting and giving people time to express ideas. And that helps a lot. Well, that's probably because we speak English, but none of us do a very good job of it. Well, so we're such a mixture of people here. We are a melting pot of people here in the United States where everyone has a different background. Well, my grandparents didn't speak English when they got here. Right. I, a lot of people don't speak English when they come here. Yeah. And this is the new land to discover and, and, learn, and learn, it, learn about. And learn about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know we when we were talking initially, Natalie you had spent some time in France and you had some very fun stories. How did that experience shape your creativity? Uh, well, the Fran my experience in France was very interesting to me because I start my reading about Europe through my advisor uh, for my master. And she was from La Martinique from mm -hmm. the Caribbean Island. Mm -hmm. And she started like, opening the world for me from the French-speaking countries. What chose me when I went to France is that I knew nothing about the world, that I was living in a tiny, beautiful, and really loving place. Mm -hmm. But it put me at a spot where I discovered that it was more. And that feeling of like being so overwhelmed by the history of other places opened the doors for like everything to me. And I also could discover the links, at least what I could see for myself between mm -hmm. the old world, what it means, the old world, and what it means to be for, like coming from the new world. And that was so, I, I felt so passionate about it. And this a German philosopher, and I'll try to translate a little bit because I have the, the Spanish translation. Mm -hmm. But he said something that, yeah, we can measure a little bit how we know about something. But in what we don't know, we are all equals. And that was what I discovered in France. Mm. That's, a, that's very profound, you know, actually. The thing about, it's very profound. The, the interesting thing about Europe is there's a lot of antiquity there in history. Mm -hmm. Even our language, even the English language started in Greece and Rome and other areas where we, the language had transcended all the different countries to where America is definitely relatively young. I mean, it's very young. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the history yeah. that Europe has, doesn't have the buildings, the architecture, the literature, the music, all of that comes out of Europe. So I could see where when you entered various parts of Europe, especially France, because France has got a tremendous history, I could see where for you, the, the way you think and the way you're educated, you must have really enjoyed that immensely. Yeah, yeah. And all, I was in Paris and the aggressiveness of the city was shocking and also helped me to build also kind of a different character. So I felt that I had like my American character, my 
French character and my Venezuelan one. It's like living in different personalities all the time. Uh, that's, <laughs> it's kind quite of, interesting. that's kind of fun. I, I, assume, I assume you bought the appropriate clothes so you could fit to those characters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of fun and I, I learned so much. You know, we before we get into discussing your photography, which we're excited to do, I'd like you to share with us a little bit about your research on ritual music. I thought some of the things you shared with us were very interesting. Well, I did, during my education, I always tried to link what I wanted or, or let's say, a phenomenon to music because I used to play the cello for a long time. So I really wanted to keep the music in every part of my life. And I, well, I got married to a musician, so that's a good way to do it. Too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but I was interested in this ritual called uh, El Ritual de las Turas because it was uh, in the same region was, uh, where, where I was born. And it's um, a very interesting ritual because the region is, is isolated and they kept playing and dancing with these particular flutes that culturas, they made by a kind of a bamboo piece. Mm -hmm. They also have other flutes that they made with uh, deer skulls. Oh my goodness. And also the maraca. So I wanted to see if music play an important role or what was the role in, in, of music in this community. And what I discovered is that in San Pedro de Maparari, which is the community, the, important that, the importance that you have in the community was related to your ability of playing or the role that you play in the ritual. Let's say the person that played the, what they consider the best, they can consult that, that people about life, about decisions. And they are also the ones that get connected to their gods. So they become the philosophers then? Yeah. Yeah. And also the, the medium between that sacred world and the normal life. That's very interesting. So like a shaman almost at that point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a ritual that is, uh, the, the, um, let's say the, the shape of the ritual is male. The males are the ones that can play the instruments, not women. Mm. And it's a circle ritual. So there is a center where they put their divinities. Some of them are Catholic saints, but also with different layers of meaning that are related to the indigenous world. Then the, the, the musicians play around this center. And then the woman can be around, like going in circles, like clockwise or the opposite. So that structure of the ritual was also the structure of the social dynamics. The most important people are the ones that can connect with that center. And that's the center of the world. And they use the ritual mostly for fertility or asking for things like health, like rain, like the river to have more water. And that was a big opportunity, an amazing opportunity for me to start thinking about the role of music in their society but also in our societies. Oh, that's extremely interesting. That is so interesting. Now, how did you see yourself connecting with that on a, on a spiritual level? Well, because it's happening in the same region where I was born, mm -hmm. I feel that that's part of my life too. It's part of what the people that was first got to see and do in order to have a better life. And that's part of who am I. My mom remembers like people saying that they were going to the Baile de las Turas. Mm -hmm. So I'm connected to that in, in a historic level, but also in a deepest way. Yeah, you would be because you would feel the energy from your community and all those that were participating in it at all levels. Yeah, and it, it is fun because when I was there, and I still don't have kids, but at the time, the chief of the ritual always said to me, like, 
oh, Natalie, you need to have kids. I'll start this prayer for you. Mm -hmm. you at, <laughs> at least some of them. Uh -huh. And I was, yeah, let's say, let, let's do it. Let, let's see what happens. <laughs> He's being helpful. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so sweet. You know, I know that we wanted to talk a little bit about you as a writer. What has been your greatest experience and personal rewards as you write? Well, writing for me is so important. And I do it because I feel that I need it. And I feel, and this sounds, I know this sounds like very cliche. Well, I'm happy, really happy if I get to share what I write with people I love. So that's probably the most important thing. If I get my dad to read what, I, what I'm writing, and if he gets to connect with that world, that's more than happy. I will be more than happy. But also, something that happened with writing is a dichotomy in a way, because it's a sense of freedom and a sense of control. So if I get to reach that level of freedom and control when I'm writing, that's very rewarding. That's something that I want to keep for me for the rest of my life. I think that's very special because all too often writers only think about their audience as a large group of people. But really, if you, I know I really feel good when my daughter reads the things I write. And I know Angie feels the same yeah. because our daughters, our daughter knows us so well. And then she has an opportunity to see how we think in an entirely different realm. It's not like a parent, but it's like us saying things that we feel deeply inside that we don't typically express. So I I could see where you're coming yeah. from on that, Natalie. That's pretty special. And I really like the analogy of having your dad read what you have written. Uh, I can see where that would be very special to you. Yeah. And at the end, it's all about connecting. Absolutely. That's what matters. If you get to connect, I think there are so reasons to continue doing it. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, you hold several degrees and one of them is in art history. And I was curious how that has impacted your creativity. Well, you know that I think I didn't know what it means to go for art history when I started. Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to go something related to humanities, but I didn't know what it means. And I knew about like the greatest artists and these books that show you the genius of the world. But something that impacted me was getting to know Venezuelan artists and Latin American artists, because that's something that doesn't have like that the same impact in publications and magazines and media. So getting to know that you don't need to be that renaissance genius in order to create. That the people to create is alive and doing it every day around you, in your country, in your continent. That was a very powerful thing to experience. And discovering the, dyna the dynamics of power, that if you have power and countries with more money have more power, you get your work exposed. But in our countries, unfortunately, we don't get the same exposure. So sure. getting to that point was very important for me in the art history, like part of my life. That's um, <laughs> the whole thing about creativity. And we always say this, it doesn't matter what you do creatively as long as you do something or we think you should do something and the simplest things that you can do, just making a piece of carving a piece of wood or whatever, bring, I think, a kind of a special energy to your soul and your well-being. So you having the opportunity to see what the artists in your country are doing, pretty special because most people don't ever really get to see that, especially at the street no, level. they don't. They really don't. Yeah. And I think that is fortunately changing with so, with social media and with spaces like this one that you have because you get to know people in other places, in other spaces, in an easier way. But this was before social media. So you get content 
mainly in classrooms mm -hmm. or libraries, but right now you have the opportunity to learn in your hand. So I'm so glad that we are getting to this point that you can see like graffiti artists, street artists, and uh, the, the discovery, the, the, the discovering process, I think is faster than it was when I was at the university. Yeah, and it's only yeah, it is, it's only definitely. growing exponentially because we have the opportunity to see artists from South America. And in fact, one of our most famous paintings that both Angie and I love, Flaming June, yes. is in mm -hmm. a museum in South America. So and ho someday we hope to see yeah, it in person. Nice. But that's So, you know, so true. And nowadays with the way social media is, it's kind of nice because you can have instant exposure within seconds of posting something around the world and influence people and touch people inside. And and I think that that's where social media really shines. Well, we wouldn't be talking to Natalie. No, we wouldn't. <laughs> we wouldn't have known you. So this is like yeah. a cool thing. Yeah, very cool thing. Yeah. So with all of your education and your life experiences, they seem to lead you to pursue photography. Can you share with us what were some of the challenges you faced, especially adapting your educational background to creating with a camera? I think that I didn't need to adapt my education to the image making mm -hmm. process. Because I think that's part of who am I or who I am. I don't know what is the correct way there. <laughs> but I think what I did and what I'm still doing, my commitment to discovering or learning is something that is there mm -hmm. and is linked to all the possible activities that I do during my everyday. But I, what, what I learn about it is that you don't need to weigh others to define you and what you do. You do, and let's say you build your identity about doing stuff and you don't need others to tell you, well, you are a photographer or you are a, an artist. If you are taking pictures, you are taking pictures and that, that's enough. You don't need others to recognize what you are doing. So that's what I learned and probably what I, uh, the path that I went through leaving my educational background and the, taking the pictures. Well, you're smart because the best thing, the best photographs are made by people that are actually out there taking pictures. And I notice every photographer has a tendency to photograph a particular subject that they find most rewarding to take photographs of. And I've noticed that you produce several images, street scenes, if you will, what goes on in your mind when you're out searching for that perfect photograph that demonstrates humanity, if you will? Mm -hmm. Well, when I arrived here, something that happened is that I didn't know English. So the camera became my way to connect, to let fear, to embrace being brave in a way. And what I wanted was going to the street and get the strength to look people through their eyes and take the photo. And what I wanted was to flow with them, kind of dance with the situation, me taking the pictures and people in, the, in that performance that is going to the street and probably getting connected to that pre-verbal space that is between you, the others, and the experience of taking the pictures and creating a reality that will be always circled in a circle there in time and owning you. Like building a dynamic where you have the power, even though you don't know how to say hi or, or ask for cheese or like having or a conversation, you can always go out and connect with people in that preverbal space. So that's what is in my mind and still is in my mind when I try to go out and look for human interactions. Well, you've done a very good job yeah, of it. Really and have. people that have the opportunity or will have the opportunity to visit your website, they're going to see some pretty remarkable 
images, but I also have to say that that they are very personal. I can we can kind of sense what you're thinking about when you actually take some of those photographs. They're not what I would consider to be typical street photographs that often show people in misery. Yours are actually, for the most part, celebrations in life. And I really, we respect you for that. I, I want to ask you, what do you hope to accomplish in the next two years? You've done so much so far. Probably. I want to keep breathing and being alive. <laughs> that's a, that's, <laughs> that's a good, a good goal. goal. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good goal. And then I would like to keep exploring different ways of seeing. And life here in Wisconsin is very still. So you have to put some effort to look things in different ways. So in the next two years, probably I'll be exploring those ways, looking for ways to get amazed by the same corners or um, angles or buildings or human activity. That's what I want. Well, you'll achieve that. I think yeah, I mean, you're, all, you're actually already on your way. And yeah, it's not like being in a super cosmopolitan area like New York or Los Angeles, where there's just so much going on. It's hard to decide which direction to point your lens. Right. But it, it, you're, you're in kind of an area that also has a lot of nature going on. So it's quite, quite beautiful where you are. True. Yeah. And also something that is interesting about this place is that you feel the machine that is keeping this country up running every day because you have the factories and you have these utilitarian buildings that are full of people that are working every day very hard in order to keep these things going. So I love the opportunity to feel that energy and that's what I would like to see and to learn to see. See, that's really wonderful. Yeah, that's wonderful. And my question is going to be, what do you want to be most remembered by? Oh, this is a difficult one. <laughs> I know it's hard. <laughs> Probably I would like to be remembered that as the crazy cat lady. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too yeah. sweet. Yeah, I love my guts. <laughs> well, that that's admirable. I like that. I'm going to ask you a tough question, though. In five words or less, what would be your advice to people that want to live or be more creatively? Now, you can have more than five words. Okay, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Probably, I would say open your eyes every day and imagine. That's really good advice. That's really good advice. Probably some of the best advice we've received. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to ask you the question that we've been asking all of our guests, which is if you could sit on a park bench and chat with anyone from the past, who would it be? Well, I think if I could get the opportunity, I'd love to get in a bench conversation mm -hmm. with Nikolaus Federman. He was a German traveler in the 16th century, and he went to Venezuela with this dream of discovering, to, to finding El Dorado. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. So he got there and he started like this huge mission of traveling and going through the forest. And I would like to get in touch with him <laughs> and ask him, how was it? Especially at the period of time that yes. he was doing it. Yeah, and uh, he was in charge of, of going through and getting in touch with the indigenous people that was there and the ones that the related to the community that I used to go there. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be, a, a, I think, a very fun conversation. <laughs> oh, I would think so. You know, you, <laughs> you've been a remarkable guest, Natalie. Yes. And... And very intelligent. Your conversations with you have been just absolutely delightful. I know both Inge and I really enjoyed everything you had to say. Unfortunately, we're kind of running out of, the, we're at the end of our time, but you were great. Absolutely yeah, great. I, I agree with you, Rod. 
And I want to let everyone know if you would like to know more about Natalie, we will have links for her under the show guest tab on thoughtrowpodcast.com so everyone can learn more about her and connect with her on social media. And please check out our website. Yeah, it's definitely worth looking at that. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And this is amazing. And I love being in this space and having the opportunity to to have a conversation with amazing people like you. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you so much, Very Natalie. kind thing to say. Okay, well, I guess bye for now. Bye. Thank you so much. Uh-huh, bye-bye. I'm really glad you tuned in today. We hope you enjoyed the thoughts and ideas we shared with you. We post a new podcast every week, so remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. So it's bye for now from my husband Rod and I, wishing everyone a great day. Thank you.